Obviously, many of you are in town for a very, very important conference looking at the whole role of alternative fuels and fleets. What does this really mean for the country? Why is it important? Why do we care? What's the role of policy at the state and federal <coughs> level in terms of addressing the whole issue of alternative fuels? We have been talking about the need to reduce oil use in this country for decades now. We have often been seen as key uh, with regard to looking at the very important role of alternative fuels and that there have been many, many issues presented in terms of why it's important to move off of oil and to really look at a much more diversified fuel portfolio. And the issues range from obviously security issues, health issues, economic development, keeping energy dollars local, um, looking at overall security, what it means to uh, um, put a, oh, still over a billion dollars out every day in this country for imported oil. And those are obviously dollars that could be used here in the United States in terms of other economic development. There are public health implications, environmental issues, so there are a range of issues about uh, uh, around the whole issue of oil, alternative fuels, how do we do a better job with regard to all of our vehicles, and what is the appropriateness of different things in different places. I think that it's very exciting that there are about 100 clean cities coalitions around the country covering uh, 46 states. And this has grown considerably over the course of the last 20 years. Hopefully, we'll see it expand even further. There are a range of fuels and different applications that we are going to be hearing about this morning. And I think the other thing that's important is what we will hear about from our speakers this morning is they come from uh, different places geographically, um, and of course, some serve in many areas around the country in terms of having a broad range of no audio. I wasn't in audio earlier. And but there are a range of applications and also a range of fuels in terms of looking at the diversity. And that's also important for us to understand that it's not just one answer, but we really are looking at a portfolio in terms of really encouraging diversification. And we'll hear about more about why and how these different uh, fuels have been selected and increased their uses, and, and what's the status and the progress from our speakers. To start us off in terms of our discussion this morning, we're going to turn to Richard Battersby, who is Executive Director of the East Bay Clean Cities Coalition in California. But he is also a board member of TEP, Transportation Energy Partners. He comes from a long background with uh, more than 25 years of experience in terms of working on alternative fuels, being involved with them in terms of fleet management, both more than 40 different uh, uh, certifications of excellence with regard to fleet management and has been uh, heading up fleet uh, management services for UC Davis uh, for a number of years. So we're very, very pleased for, uh, to have Richard uh, come up and, and provide kind of an overview of what we see <coughs> with regard to looking at clean cities and the overall uh, picture that we're then going to hear about more specifically from our Thank you, Carol. Uh, like you mentioned, I have a pretty good background in fleet. Some of you might suspect that I'm not a public speaker uh, by trade, and by the end of this, I will confirm that suspicion. But uh, I'm here today with the Transportation <coughs> Energy Partners, and I want to talk a little bit about alternative fuels and the importance of federal policies uh, in reducing our nation's dependence on foreign petroleum. Next slide, please. Uh, just a brief overview on Transportation Energy Partner. We provide policy support to the Clean Cities Coalition, over almost 100 coalitions nationwide, and 18,000 stakeholders throughout the nation. Uh, we keep the stakeholders and the coalitions informed on important policies, initiatives, and funding opportunities. And as you see here today, we also educate decision makers about the importance of alternative fuel. Next slide, please. Uh, why are alternative fuels critical? 
And I got a nice visual up there. Uh, one of the key points, folks usually recognize the environmental aspect of alternative fuels, and they probably uh, get the energy security component as well. But there's a huge economic benefit to using alternative fuels since our nation currently spends over a billion dollars a day on foreign petroleum. And you can see by the visual, I've got Bill Gates there next to ten thousand dollars bills. That's how much our nation sends overseas every day on petroleum products. And you might wonder, how do I know that's Bill Gates? Well, who else has 10 pallets of $100 bills in their product? <laughs> so, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm also the executive director of the Clean Cities Program. A little bit about Clean Cities, a uh, uh, program that's sponsored by Department of Energy. I mentioned the numbers, 100 coalitions, 18,000 stakeholders. But what we do is we bring folks together. We're actually on the ground, uh, one of the only, or the only initiatives that actually are engaged with alternative fuel vehicle deployment and infrastructure deployment. And we bring folks together, uh, fleets, fuel providers, uh, infrastructure providers, sometimes funding providers, and we're just that uh, catalyst that brings everyone together for a successful project. Um, do I have my slide back? <laughs> okay, I'll just keep going. Anyway, uh, since 1993, we've displaced more than five billion gallons, and that's very significant throughout the nation. And if the my slides were working, oh, there it is, good. Uh, next slide, a little visual there shows the five billion gallons. Uh, you can go back to the other one. Four. That's it. Um, I mentioned before, benefits of alternative fuels, it's the three E's. It's the energy, the economic, and then the environmental security of our nation. All these things roll up to a, a much bigger picture, though. It's actually a, a, an issue of importance to national security. Uh, we spend a lot of time sending our armed folks in the armed forces, myself being a veteran, know this firsthand, uh, helping our allies who we rely upon for petroleum fuel. Uh, that billion dollars a day that we send overseas, if we could keep that here in the United States domestically, producing the fuel, making the vehicles, using the fuels here in the United States, there would be a huge economic benefit to our country, as well as the environmental aspect, too. Uh, Clean Cities deploys four main strategies, alternative renewable fuel, idle reduction measures, fuel economy improvements, and new technologies. We're focusing on the alternative fuels here today. Next slide, please. Uh, you might wonder, I apologize, the slide's a bit washed out. This just shows the different alternative fuels currently in use. The lion's share, almost 73%, uh, or, or excuse me, this shows the different strategies currently in use. Uh, to, to uh, reduce our nation's dependence on foreign petroleum. The majority is alternative fuel and vehicles at 73%. That's the big green slice of the fly. Bye. Next slide, please. And this shows the contributions by fuel type, the different alternative fuels in use. Uh, the largest number, over 60%, is natural gas currently. Uh, Biodiesel is at 17%. Ethanol, E85 ethanol is at 11%. Uh, propane, about 8%. And electric's three percent. There are some others, hydrogen, uh, small quantity. And the numbers at the bottom show just last year the petroleum displaced by clean cities. Uh, year to year increase of almost eleven percent. We did five hundred and thirty one million gallons last year. Next slide, please. This shows the number of alternative fuel vehicles in, in use in our country. I'm not going to break down each one. I'm just going to point out a, a couple significant uh, points here. The purple number are E85 vehicles. It doesn't look very purple on that slide. It's uh, darkish blue on that version. Those are E85 vehicles. You can see there's a significant number over the last six or seven years. And even more importantly, that number does not include vehicles in the hands of private citizens. That's just fleet vehicles. So we have large numbers of E85 vehicles. The bar across the bottom represents electric vehicles showing slow, steady growth. Next slide, please. This slide is the alternative fuel vehicle stations currently deployed. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, we've got large numbers of E85 capable flex fuel vehicles being deployed. But the number of the stations that are represented there across the bottom in green, the station count is still relatively small. So there's a huge opportunity out there with E85 where the vehicles are out on the ground running. They're running on gasoline for the most part because we haven't uh, caught up with the vehicle count and the station count. And then also, if you notice the top bars on the right, the light blue, those are electric vehicle stations. So we're getting a lot of electric vehicle stations out there on the ground, but the number of vehicles hasn't quite caught up with the station count. So 
include sort of flip flop scenarios. Next slide, please. So, why is federal incentives and support important to these efforts? Well, we really need a combination of public and private partnership. We need the federal policies, and we also need the federal funding to continue these programs. It's very difficult to get some of these technologies from the laboratories out onto the ground, so it's, it's important that the federal government establishes policies and also provides funding to keep these programs going. Three key points that we're, we're hoping to communicate today is we want to ensure funding is maintained for federal programs such, that, such as the DOE Vehicle Technologies Program and the EPA Clean Diesel Program. We'd like to see the tax incentives for alternative fuel vehicles and infrastructure extended, and we'd also like to preserve the renewable fuel standard. Next slide, please. And to help us further the discussion, we brought some folks from the National Association of Fleet Administrators to talk about some very specific uh, alternative fuel vehicle projects. Um, NAPA is the premier fleet industry organization in the United States. It's been around since 1957. Uh, it's got over 2,200 fleet members that control over 6 million vehicles. And I will say the gentlemen at the table are my colleagues, not just from the industry and through NAPA, but also through the Clean Cities Coalitions over the year. So we're going to hear from Claude Masters, who's from Florida Power and Light, and he's president of the NAPA Fleet Management Association. And then Jeffrey Jeter, who's the fleet manager of Chesterfield County, Virginia, and treasurer of NAPA. And also Steve Saltzgiver, who's vice president of fleet manager, management for public services and chair of NAPA's government affairs committee. So with that, I'll turn the microphone over to Claude. Thank you, Richard. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, so uh, let me uh, give you a brief introduction to NAPA. Uh, appreciate the uh, kind introduction there, my friend. And uh, first, let me apologize real quick because the uh, Kind folks here at TEP asked me to come speak, and they said you got 12 minutes, and I tried to decline because, as you can tell, I'm not from around uh, this part of the country, and it typically takes me five to ten minutes to say hello. So I just ate up one minute of my 12 minutes of time. So with that, let me let me give you a quick um, background on that. So what is NAPA and what do we do? So essentially, NAPA is a not-for-profit -for membership society that serves the needs of those practicing what we like to call the art and science of automotive fleet management. So the best way to think of it is think of NAPA uh, being the AMA uh, to the medical profession. We are the that basically that association that provides that type of support to the fleet industry. So next slide. So as you can see, we've got over 3,200 members and suppliers across the United States and Canada, and we have members in every state in the United States and every province of Canada. And the average fleet size of our, of our members is 2,100 pieces of equipment. So next slide, please. So with that, you say, well, what does NAPA do? And essentially what we like to tell people is that we provide solutions. So as you can see, our members tell us that the, of those five four things that we do up there, each one has a kind of their own perspective on what piece of that brings the most value. Some people say networking and being able to talk to the other member uh, fleet managers is very important because they can glean intelligence that way, uh, that way. Others say that they just want us to be their representation on Capitol Hill. And others say that I'm strictly in it for the education. And how that relates to where we are today is the fact that our curriculum and our CAFM program has a lot of content that helps educate fleet managers about alternative fuels, how to make those business cases, and which selections are right for them. Next slide, please. So you might say, well, why are we here today? And essentially, we're here to help provide facts and fact-filled information. So we've got a panel of gentlemen here. We have a, a years and years, people that typically probably couple hundred years of fleet e expertise and experience that can help tell you a little bit about what works and what doesn't work in specific applications and, and give you a little history about what works best for them. Next slide, please. And next slide. So again, as 
Mr. Badaby so kindly said, and I'm, I currently am the uh, manager of vehicle acquisitions and fuel for Florida Crown and Light, so that means I get to deal with not only bringing all the alternative fuel vehicles into our fleet, but I get to make decisions about what kind of fuel we run them on. Next slide, please. So I'll just give you a quick history. There's a lot, a lot of granularity there, but FPL has a fairly extensive uh, experience in operating uh, hybrid, plug-in hybrid <coughs> battery electric vehicles. It dates back into the 90s, and you can see the breakdown there. I won't read them all to you, but as you can see, that we've evolved with technology. So most people in this room know that hybrid electric vehicles have been around for quite some time. Plug-in hybrid electrics are becoming more and more common from an OEM perspective. And you also see a lot of battery electric vehicles making their way into the marketplace. So with that, next slide please. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how this, uh, the technology is evolving into the medium and heavy duty truck market. So FDL was uh, very heavily involved in the development of hybrid bucket trucks for use at job site. We actually chaired a working group that partnered with uh, the Department of Defense and CalSTAR to help develop this technology. And today we have 74 of those vehicles in, in, our, uh, in our fleet with a, uh, a great deal of success with the operational experience with those vehicles. We've also incorporated a number of battery electric vehicles in our fleet. We've got uh, Transit Connects and International P-Stars in our fleet as well. So we get a lot of operational experience with those vehicles about what works, what applications to put them in, and where they're better suited in regards to uh, in, in, in regards to the way that they operate in the, in the real world. So, uh, next slide, please. So through our efforts, we received quite a bit of, uh, for lack of a better term, public accolades. And it depends. Uh, there's a lot of industry journals out there that print where you're at and compare fleets to each other. Some are self-reporting, but we uh, we have been awarded the eighth largest hybrid electric fleet uh, in the nation by Green Fleet Magazine last year. And uh, we're continuing to escalate the, the way that we uh, apply that technology. So we were having a conversation last night, and, and I think that the, the point that we try to, we, we would like to try to make today is that, um, you know, a lot of people will debate what technology is the best or what fuels the cleanest. But I can tell you for sure the one thing that I've learned over my years of experience is the cleanest gallon of fuel that we'll ever burn is the one that we don't have to burn. So the point is, is that as you stack these technologies, so like when we take our hybrid electric bucket trucks that can run on the job site in, in electric mode, run the electric PTO, and then you stack that with a B20 biodiesel blend in your truck, so you now displace 20% of your petroleum burn. So a typical bucket truck that might burn 10 gallons of fuel a day is down in the neighborhood of five to six gallons of petroleum diesel. So um, we think that's a commendable effort. Next page, please. And so I want to talk just real briefly about our, our biodiesel program because we're, we're real proud of it. The Department of Energy tells us that we're one of the largest users of biodiesel in the Southeast. Uh, we have over 1,700 trucks in our fleet that run on B20 daily. Um, and, and, you know, the thing that often comes into play is we don't have any, um, lack of a better term, issues with operating biodiesel that you hear from time to time from other people. And a lot of it has to do with the way that we buy and blend our own fuel. We are a registered fuel blender, so we buy B100 and blend it ourselves in our we have a two million gallon storage tank that we put it in. And so we, we ride a very tight fuel spec. We understand that the feedstock comes from a renewable source and it's domestically grown, so we're very proud of that. And then you can see the numbers that, um, in regards to the emissions reductions and the total energy usage that we see year over year. That, that is a is a kind of shining testament to how effective those programs can be when you look at the way that you operate your vehicles and you see year over year that your fuel burn is going down and yet your fleet count continues to be steady or gradually increases, you know that you're having a positive impact. So with that, I, you know, I think the last 
uh, thing that I'd like to say about that is, is that it uh, it helps you when you when you know that you can see that you're making a difference and it aligns with your corporate strategy or corporate vision to do everything that you possibly can do to not only help reduce our dependence on foreign oil, but also reduce the, uh, the emissions, the overall emissions profile of our fleet. So with that, I think I might be a little bit ahead, which I lied to you. I told you I was going to run long. But I really want to try to save some time at the end for questions. So with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to my <laughs> comrade, Mr. Jeff Jeter. <coughs> Uh, like I said, I'm from a, a local municipality government, so I'm not like my big hitters, my buddies up here. But we're just as important in some things that we go through. And uh, first of all, you know, I'm a Chesco County fleet manager, a little over 2,400 vehicles that I'm in charge of. And we're, we're doing our best to go to alternative fuels. Um, I have a passion for that. I love it. Um, over the years, I've had the honor to work in Virginia Clean City. They helped me get some programs going, and then currently working with the Miami Auto Gas, lots of fuel that are helping with these. Um, when I go to sell this, you know, programs to my officials in the county, you know, they're always asking me, Jeff, why are we going to do this? You know, so I've always said like three main reasons that I always look at, you know, is decrease our reliance on corn oil, um, you know, decreasing air pollution, lower cost of fuel. Those are the three, and they always ask me to categorize them. I go. I used to do it, but every time I was asked that, I always moved them around and changed it. So now, really, all three of those to me are the number one priority I look at. Then I've actually added a fourth one to that, that um, it, it actually increases worldwide job opportunities. So we're looking at that nucleus. Um, this slide here is showing the little picture in the middle. We actually got uh, our local TV news channel came in and did a story on us with our uh, police vehicles that we just did with the Lance Auto Gas. So, you know, why, why use auto gas? What I can get to my supervisors. It improves air quality, 50% less CO, 68% less NOx, and 99% less particulates. Uh, the availability, it's got the highest <coughs> number of refueling sites than any other alternative fuel. Uh, it's 6% natural gas, it helps diversify the energy supply. The quick installation, the LPG refueling infrastructure can be installed in within 30 to 60 days. Um, we just had that done in my location, where if you look at a natural gas, you're looking six months to a year for the installation to be done. So that's why I went with all the gas on that. Um, low infrastructure, you know, of the kit in the, in, the, uh, in the site is far less lower than CNG. Um, LP cars, while I look at my municipality, I can do a conversion now on a police cruiser for roughly $4,200. And uh, then I'll have some pictures in here a little bit later where it shows some of the different sites and how easy that they are to install. Also, the performance of the vehicle. I've got school buses, I've got police cruisers. The operators absolutely love it. Once we train them and talk them about it, especially diesel engines, you know, they can be accelerated now and they're gone. Police officers, they absolutely love them for performance. This slide here. Um, I only showed uh, about 12 vehicles over a six month period. This is the cost savings that I've that I saved per month. October is where we actually kicked it off last year, so it was a little low. Everything was going good until uh, January, February. That's when all the cold air hit out west and we started missing the propane. The uh, supply wasn't there and cost really went high. So we lost it in, um, in February, but then March, April, maybe we're starting to come back up now. So this is what I'm I track every, every month on that. Next slide, please. This year, just a comparison, what I'm showing, it shows like in October, I got purchased 345 gallons of auto gas. And what is shown in the next column is the metric ton of CO. If I didn't use gasoline for that amount, I would have missed 3.05. Uh, the LP was 2.01, so I had a 1.05 reduction for that month. So overall, you can see that. There's a 15.4 reduction by using LP over gasoline and metric tons, and then pound to CO, it was almost 34. So these are just some comparisons that I'm running to show that even a small municipality fleet, you know, we're doing our part of saving. Next slide. This is the one I'm really happy with. Um, I did this with my sheriff's department. This is actually on 20 vehicles. Um, I was showing to roughly 27,000 miles per year. And it's got GPM, uh, MPG for gasoline is 15 and propane is roughly 12.7. You lose a little bit. But 
but um, on price wise, gas at this time was three dollars and fourteen cents per cane of one twenty six. So you can see the savings. The monthly savings per vehicle is two hundred fifty three dollars. So for all twenty vehicles, I actually saved almost sixty one thousand dollars that year. And I looked at that and I went back to my officials and I said, sixty one thousand dollars. What can we do with that? And we can save off gasoline. That was two and a half to three police cruises we could have purchased. It's two full time positions we could put in. So it helps fund a lot of different areas. So I'm real happy with that. And um, this does not include the school buses. This was just 20 police cruisers that we had that savings on. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just some of the things I'm showing on my service vehicles that we've actually done. Um, this is one that I actually put a line of auto gas to help me um, take care of the conversion on this one. This is just one of my service vans that we have out for our school division that runs all over the county. And so we put the decals on the public is really supporting us, wanting us to do more. But um, the funding, you know, I'll plead to you guys just a little bit on that. Next slide. This is one of my police cruisers. That's just one of the markings on the back. Um, I can't put a whole lot of decals on my police cruisers. Um, the colonel will let me. But by law, I've got a little propane sticker on the back right there. Next slide. And this just shows, you know, how easy it is with the converter. This is actually in the, in the trunk of a Ford police cruiser crown <coughs> It's just a double tank up in, in the wheel well area. It's very simple to work on. Next slide. This is the fuel site. When I was talking about how easy it is to, to install this, um, my work relation with the line is lots of fuel. You know, we talked about this. this. This unit came in on a skid mount, and I'm talking 30 days. It took me longer to run the power from my building to this tank than it did for these guys to put it in and get it operational for me. That's how quick we got it up and going. That's why I picked auto gas for my town. Next slide. This is a larger tank. Uh, the first one I showed you was roughly 1,000 gallons. This was 10,000 gallons. I had this at a previous job that I had when I had the school division on there. And again, we probably had this one installed within 90 days. It's just a little bit larger tank. You couldn't come in on a skid. In fact, you had to get a crane to come in and pick that tank up and set it on its pedestal. Next slide. And this is just a dispenser. You know, it shows that, you know, it shows all the gallons used. It's got a keypad where I can track all the information. It's just a very simple, clean operation for this. Next slide, please. So how can you help? You know, that's what I'm looking for right now. Um, I would love, like Rick said, I'd love to see the taxes that have come back. This really helps the municipalities like mine, you know, where we get that 50 cents per gallon rebate back to go towards converting more vehicles. Definitely grant funding. Um, the slide I showed you was $61,000. That was actually through Virginia Clean City. I was able to get those at no cost to my county. I just had to provide the vehicle, and that was a no-brainer for me to sell that. Um, currently, we're out in Chesco County. We're actually having to fund all of this because the grant money is gone. I mean, Virginia Clean City did all they could do, and um, you know, hoping and praying they're getting more funding because the municipalities are really excited about moving forward with auto gas in our area. Um, work on more funding for infrastructure. I uh, hear a lot of talk within my state where we're trying to get public-private um, partnerships on our fuel infrastructure, which could be compressed natural gas, it could be LP, it could be all, but we just need help with the funding. Um, one of the big things I'd like to see is OEMs you know, get together with Congress and everybody and see what they can do about actually making a true biofuel um, propane vehicle so that we can buy them from the OEMs like that without doing the conversions. I know that hurts my partners with Alliance Auto Gas and all, but it would make it a lot easier for municipalities to do that. And um, just help reduce some of the red tape. Um, there's so much red tape to go through, but we have that everywhere. But on local governments, so we're trying our best. And we're, you know, we're all excited, you know, like Claude was saying, Napa. We've got so many different little cities, counties within the state of Virginia. Everybody's on board wanting to go with the LG because it is currently the cheapest, quickest, and best way for us. Um, we're looking at CNG, we're looking at E85, we've got all those, but the fuel infrastructures are just not there. Um, I'm real excited about auto gas, that's the way I'm going with um, I've got my shop certified, we can actually do the installs ourselves now, we're certified to work on them, and all that came from funding and help from Alliance Auto Gas. So, uh, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you.
our last speaker before we open it up for Q&A, who is Steve Salzgiver, who is Vice President of Point Management for Republic Services, and he brings a very rich background, having been also uh, a fleet manager for Coca-Cola Refreshment for the state of Georgia and also for the state of Utah. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be here and uh, speak a little bit about the alternative fuels. I've been now in this business, uh, I always say over 30 years now. It's probably getting closer to 40 years. But uh, <clears throat> I've had the opportunity to work for several different states and, and uh, opportunity to work for a couple of private companies as well. I uh, just uh, recently joined Republic Services. And uh, so I'm, I'm still getting uh, my feet on the ground there. but. Uh, Republic Services, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the county, as every, what many of you may know. Uh, some of you live in the Washington area, you'll see uh, refuge trucks running around with AAA on the side. That's one of our subsidiaries um, here in this area. Republic Services is a Phoenix-based company, so if you see me yawning up here, it's because it's about 6 o'clock in the morning back where I'm from. But um, we're an industry leader in uh, waste management. In the Fortune 500 company, we have about 30,000 employees in 40 states in Puerto Rico. We operate 30, 332 uh, collection companies and 195 transfer stations. As I walked out of the hotel yesterday morning uh, on my way to breakfast, I could uh, smell a transfer station somewhere close. That uh, is the smell of money. So, in this business, uh, <clears throat> We do everything we can to uh, take care of our customers. Customers are what we're all about, and uh, we have uh, currently about 1,800 uh, natural gas vehicles that we're operating. And so, why why natural gas for us? Uh, next slide. Well, let's uh, talk about energy reduction. It's a little bit hard as it's up my turn. So look at that. Uh, forgive me. Um, CNG trucks are, are what we're focused on at uh, <coughs> Republic Services. Uh, in my previous uh, background, it was mentioned that uh, Coca-Cola, for example, we were working on, uh, we had 800 uh, hybrid electric trucks, and we were doing some CNG, some some that, um, some uh, biodiesel. So the one thing that uh, you've heard from our panel up here is that there is not one size fits all. And uh, depending on the business that you operate in, you know, the, the opportunities that you have, you need to really adapt to uh, what makes sense for your business. Having worked for uh, two different states and four different governors, uh, we had quite a portfolio that we put together for each of those applications as well. And so one of the things that I will say is I've gone through uh, a different state of fleet management is uh, you become pretty diverse in your background of what works in alternative fuels. Um, one of the things that uh, we're working on currently is uh, hydraulic hybrid, which is uh, not a real new technology. It's been around for a while, but that's also uh, a good application for the refuge business. And so we're testing currently out in uh, Chula Vista, California, a couple of vehicles. We're going to be moving that to uh, Cleveland here shortly and making a, a couple tests there. Uh, we're hoping that that technology is uh, very lucrative for us to, to try in addition to CNG in our portfolio. Um, a couple of uh, applications we had at Coca-Cola when I was there were the uh, hybrid electric vehicles, which were much like the Prius. You know, that you turn the engine off, and we were all talking just earlier, and uh, I always like Claude's statement about uh, the, the cleanest fuel is the one you don't burn. And you think about uh, what we're trying to do in, in big uh, industrial applications and commercial applications. And we're trying to not burn fuel at, at any, any time where it's wasted. And probably the biggest waste is when that truck is idling. And uh, you don't have an opportunity all the time to save that fuel unless you can figure out a way to shut that truck down. Um, so one, some of the things that uh, other applications we're using are telematics. Um, we're monitoring the uh, weight management. Uh, imagine in the refuge business in one of those trucks uh, has about 12 ton payload as we're going uh, you know, from stop to stop by the time we dump. And so the more we can manage that way through better routing, um, better uh, uh, route optimization, uh, driver behavior is a big key factor. So we're looking at all types of solutions besides alternative fuels as we go forward. Uh, next slide. You can go to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we look at at Republic Services is, uh, you know, why, why are we doing this? First of all, it's the right thing to do as a corporate citizen and a corporate 
partner, we want to be economically responsible. Uh, at Republic Services, if you see our star, it's made up of five R's, and one of those stars is responsible. And so as we go through, we look at the different applications, we want to make sure that we're, we are that corporate citizen. Uh, it's cleaner, the emissions are lower, it's increasingly uh, alternative fuels are mandated, but uh, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do in our business. It's local, natural gas is abundant here in the United States. It's a, a domestic fuel. And probably the best thing uh, for public service or any Fortune 500 company like we are is it's, it's cheaper. And it helps us uh, grow the bottom line as we're out there and we're competing for customers and business. Next slide. Uh, solid waste industry is um, a large uh, natural gas vehicle market. So there's about 2 billion gallons a year in our market, 200,000 trucks that are addressable. And uh, so you can imagine uh, the size of this and the scope of this market. And this is a really, CNG is a good application for the refuge industry. We do a lot of start and stop, as you can imagine, as we're picking up uh, uh, commercial, municipal, and residential uh, trash. As we go through, uh, we're burning a lot of a lot of fuel. Uh, we we measure fuel by uh, the gallons per hour and the cost per hour versus the miles per gallon, like traditionally. We're currently running uh, somewhere around uh, fourteen dollars uh, an hour for diesel fuel, and natural gas is about ten dollars an hour. So that gives you kind of the scale and the scope of what we're operating out there. So every single uh, gallon we can save per hour really helps uh, in our, our bottom line and also helps with the, uh, um, the market out there and, and certainly our health, you know, people uh, out there in the market. Um, most of our trucks have somewhere between 35 and 50 uh, diesel gallon equivalents on them at CNG. And one of the things that we consider as we go and start deploying this is our fleet returns to base every night. So we have uh, our infrastructure put on site and then we uh, connect those at night and plug them in. So that's one of the things that we look at. And CNG actually, for us, requires a little bit less infrastructure um, than some of the other applications out there. Next slide. This just uh, gives you an idea of what we were to be deployed uh, just last year. We currently have uh, 1,800 trucks in service, which is about 12% of our 16,000 fleet. Um, and you can see uh, we put those in uh, very key markets. Uh, we're continuing to have steady growth. We built 10 fueling stations in, uh, in 2013. Those stations are uh, a few million dollars each to build. They cost us about uh, 400,000 to 400,000 to upgrade our shop so we can work on these vehicles. So we've got quite a, an investment in this technology. Uh, we have a total of uh, 31 fueling sites now nationwide. Uh, We've, that's 31 of about 400 uh, operations that we're currently running. Uh, anyway. This is just a, a glide path to give you kind of an idea where we're going uh, with our natural gas operation. Um, currently we're in 2014. We're adding about um, 400 to 500 trucks a year as we go through the process. And that gives you an idea of going out. Uh, our plan is to be over 3,000 trucks in the next few years. Uh, next slide. One of the things, these are just some of the considerations that we look at as we start to deploy trucks. Is, um, so we want to continue uh, to meet our regulatory uh, mandates, and you know, the environment's continuing to uh, become more regulatory out there. We want to be our good corporate citizens, as I mentioned before. We look at um, where we're going to deploy these fleets. We look at uh, where our largest fleets are, where we can get the best uh, bang for the buck, so to speak. And uh, we also want to make sure we have good OEM support, dealer support, so uh, we can maintain these vehicles properly. Uh, fleet returns to base. And then uh, we want to be a, a suitable sized fleet so we're close to access the actual pipeline, um, have adequate space. Uh, as you can imagine, we upfit our shops. Um, and we want to make sure we have the, the proper uh, permitting that ha has to happen as you go through your work for the city. It takes us about one year uh, of prep work to put in one of these uh, operations. Uh, as we go through, we work through the construction and the city planning, zoning, and all those uh, 
different things that you have to go through to, to get these sites deployed. Our fleet composition, uh, we look at our replacement cycle. Uh, as, you, as you can imagine, there's a couple of, uh, and I'll talk about a couple of advantages and disadvantages, but uh, when you deploy uh, these, these vehicles, we're trying to do about, really the, the sweet point for us is about 50 trucks at a site. And uh, if we go into a site with 100 trucks, we're replacing half that fleet in one year. And uh, that gives us some logistical hoops that we have to jump through uh, down the road because now that means in uh, 10 years, half that fleet is due for replacement. So we've had to devise some, uh, some creative strategies to go in and what we call our trickle down truck strategy. We'll take trucks and we'll start logistically moving those around the country to fill in gaps so that we can offset some of that. So as those trucks begin to age, we trickle them down and move them around. And, and we've had to do that to, uh, to keep our our cost down uh, to make this uh, economically feasible. Next slide. Um, one thing I mentioned earlier, um, and you've heard a lot of us talk about this, there is no one size fits all. And so you have to be aware of that when you're a fleet manager. Um, location makes a big difference, just like real estate. Location, location, location. We want to make sure we have these in the right spot. Um, the shop improvements and zoning I've talked about are critical. You need to make sure you have all everything in place before you deploy these. And then uh, one of the other challenges that we have uh, in the market is we don't have enough suppliers. Um, currently in, in our market with natural gas, we have one engine supplier, and that's uh, Cummins Diesel. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we would like to see is a little bit more competition in that. Uh, probably Cummins would not like to see more competition, but uh, for us that would be critical as we go forward. And, uh, and really look at to deploy more of these vehicles. Uh, some of the other challenges that we have, or as I mentioned, the log logistics can be a challenge for us. I mean, moving 60,000 trucks all around the country to try and uh, accommodate or support deploying some of these vehicles. Uh, weight and payload are a big uh, challenge for, for the refuge industry. We have a lot of bridge laws out there that we have to maintain and meet. And, as you put in different engines and add tanks to trucks, that adds increased weight. So we're having to, wherever we add weight, we have to take away weight so that we don't decrease our payload. A payload to, to the refuge industry is money. And so we've had to uh, go through and really look at that, uh, all the opportunities to scale those down. Um, there's a lot of creative uh, things happening in the industry. A lot of our partners are really helping us to manage some of those uh, obstacles that we, that we see. One of the things, too, that uh, they don't talk about a lot, the power outage is, a, is an opportunity or a challenge for us. We lose power, we can't charge trucks, so we have to have emergency generators uh, on all of our sites where we deploy those uh, operations. Uh, next. next slide. This just gives you uh, an idea of what our field sites look like. If you, uh, uh, you go into any one of our operations around the country, it pretty much looks exactly like this. Our operators will back into those sites, plug them in, and uh, let them fill overnight so that they're ready for the next day's use. And uh, it's a pretty slick, easy way to do uh, the fill up. And uh, uh, we're going to have a pretty good block, uh, good morale with our drivers. So it's been very well received around the country um, where we deployed the uh, Probably the best thing about the natural gas operation that we're operating public is our customers like it. Uh, we've won several contracts, so from an economical standpoint, that's a big benefit as well because the communities want cleaner air. They want to know that we're good corporate citizens. So that's a big advantage. Next slide. And then and finally, this, this really talks about what I just said, but I mean, ultimately, uh, the benefits for the environment, uh, benefits for operational. I was just in uh, Houston about a month ago. We were uh, bringing our board of directors for Republic down there to look at our uh, operation in the Houston area. We had three trucks lined up uh, sitting outside our shop, and uh, you can hear it. the two diesel trucks out there running. And uh, we asked uh, the diesels to shut down the truck, and the CNG truck was running also, but you could not hear it. And it was uh, very compelling to see that. And you know, quiet trucks, especially refuse trucks, when they're rolling around your neighborhood at seven in the morning, that's a big advantage to our customers. We're not waking up anybody and we're, we're rolling through the town pretty quiet. So 
Uh, we see that as a big advantage. Obviously, the financial benefits, so uh, we, we see almost the savings of $3 an hour in fuel. And then uh, our customers are starting to really identify with natural gas. And that's becoming more and more of a, a request as we start working with our customers out there. Uh, last slide. So uh, that, that's all I have. Um, we'll uh, take questions and uh, go from there. Well, that was terrific, um, all of you. Uh, a lot of information, and again, it's always compelling to hear, uh, also in such a short period of time in terms of looking at the, the range of applications, uh, the diversity of fuels, the, all of the reasons, the multiple benefits uh, of why alternative fuels, and, and it also makes good sense in terms of economics. So whether it's security, public health, environment, and obviously the economics have to work, and the numbers that you were talking about, very, very impressive. So let's open it up for your questions and comments. Okay. I'm a little concerned about the support for natural gas in terms of the environmental destruction from fracking, the toxic chemicals, um, which seems to be trading clean air for clean water, and the notion of still having to drill and have pipelines and the environmental destruction often associated with that. I've heard of garbage trucks in upstate New York that are 100% plug-ins, so I'm wondering what the future of that is, what is the future of burning the garbage um, for fuel. I do believe Henry Ford had a hemp operated electric car. Is anyone looking at hemp as a source of fuel? Switchgrass was talked about at one time. I'm, um, I'm heartened by some of the emphasis on the electric vehicles and hopefully batteries will um, somehow improve to extend the charge and the mileage per charge. But in the meantime, what about some of these other options? Uh, I'll, I'll tackle that one. Um, first on the fracking issue, uh, natural gas in the transportation industry is actually less than 1% of all natural gas used in the United States. And um, we try not to, to make the association with fracking um, taking a position one way or the other. Uh, we also know that the major uses of natural gas are currently for heating and electricity, so it's rather unfair to come to the transportation industry that represents less than 1% of the natural gas to raise the fracking issue. Um, that being said, the other technologies are, are certainly viable. You mentioned something about burning uh, trash for fuel. We actually have several significant projects that take landfill, um, waste and turn it into vehicle fuel. I can give you a classic example from within the East Bay Clean Cities Coalition region. We've got the Altamont landfill that waste management, sorry, sorry Steve, uh, one of the competitors of Public, Republic Services. Um, we got that project installed and it pr produces 13,000 gallons of liquefied natural gas each day. And that's not a typo. 13,000 gallons of fuel from trash that's producing the natural gas that's used in that vehicle, extremely low carbon content. It, it comes pretty close, close to a closed loop scenario where the trash trucks go out, they bring f uh, trash into the landfill, which then composes and makes the fuel so those trucks can go out and get more trash. And there is great promise with battery electric, uh, need a little more work on the heavy duty side. At Clean Cities, we support all alternative fuels. We're not uh, invested in one or the other. The way to be successful is to offer customers or fleet users choice, and by having the full spectrum of the fuels out there, that's how we achieve success. So I hope I've answered your questions. And I, and I can add too that uh, at Republic we have 70 landfill to gas energy projects currently underway. So we're doing the same thing that uh, you mentioned about waste management. Also, uh, having worked at Coca-Cola for the last several years before I joined Republic, uh, I see the battery industry as very viable. We're actually looking at uh, partnering to test some of that in the refuge industry now. Uh, biggest challenge you have with the battery in, in this industry is the weight, the added weight that you 
them. So when you add the weight and the battery, you have to take that out somewhere. So we're we'll continuing to look at that. And we just actually met with a company last week to start some testing on some of those and uh, uh, wrap up some projects to do that. So uh, I, I personally think it's a potentially viable uh, technology, all electric. Uh, I'm a big proponent of all electric. We had uh, several dozen of those Coca Cola when I was there. It's a good technology and it's a very clean, you know, technology. And if I could just add real quick a, a comment to that. So we were having a discussion about, you know, everybody wants to pick a winner, right? Who, who's going to be the winner in the long game? But at the end of the day, the, the, tech not, the technology developments that have been made with uh, battery electric and hybrid electric vehicles are pretty significant. Here's why. Because whether or not you believe that the battery electric vehicles will, will win the end game or not, the work that's been done in tor towards uh, electrifying all the ancillary components, like electric air conditioning, power steering, power brakes, so on and so on, that's enabled um, the auto manufacturers to take parasitic load loss off of the internal combustion engine, and that will migrate over into the heavy duty trucking world. And that's a monster that we haven't even addressed yet. I mean, we're, we got a lot of work to do in, in regards to that. But if you think about it, though, you know, if you can take 45 to 70 horsepower of load loss off of an internal combustion engine, that enables you to downsize that power plant, make it more fuel efficient. So the work is significant, okay? So we shouldn't really, we shouldn't discount that. And in regards to um, the, the actual battery electric vehicles themselves. Obviously, the, um, you know, the, the holy grail of that, it's all about energy density, right? How much energy can you get into that, into that packaging? So there's a lot of work that's being done on that, and I can tell you that, that it's accelerating much faster than what most people think it is, so in terms of the chemistry and the cost. So I, I think what you're gonna see is, is that that aspect of the marketplace is going to accelerate much faster than what most people think it is. Great. Good, good explanation. And, and I think one of the things that it's so easy to forget to is that the more that, the more work that is done, the more deployment of a whole lot of different technologies, it keeps pushing the R&D forward and, and it helps uh, technology developers also see that there are people that are interested in looking at different things and you've got to deploy in order to sort of push the development of the, of the technology forward. So, um, and, and I think it's been very incredible in terms of how quickly some of the developments on the electrification and that is, I mean, after seeing it looks like nothing going on for a long time, that there are now huge developments that are being made. And I think all of the biogas that we're seeing on the and a lot of wastewater treatment projects is, is also very, very exciting. So that everything gets turned into a report. Um, thank you. Okay, question, question back. Hi, Charlie Garlow, Electric Vehicle Association. I was wondering if anybody had done a comparison between the propane and the natural gas and electricity on an apples to apples sort of comparison, dollars per mile or dollars per gallon equivalent or something like that. Um, it's like all very uh, you know, reasonable, and I was wondering if uh, one ahead or, or are that dynamic changing as we see natural gas prices going up and down, or what's the perspective in that regard? Has anybody done that uh, sort of look? Um, <clears throat> I haven't actually done that comparison as, as you described, but as a fleet manager, that's one of our, our primary functions to determine total cost of ownership for vehicles. The reason that the, I think the study that you just asked about doesn't exist in, in my arena is I haven't made that comparison yet, but there are tools online. Um, there's a total cost of ownership calculator that the uh, Department of Energy has created. It's on the Alternative Fuel Data Center website, so you can kind of plug in the variables just like you described. It's actually a really useful tool because it compensates by region for the cost of not just the fuels, but also the electricity and then the environmental impact as well. So I suggest uh, for those numbers, you head to the Alternative Fuel Data Center website. I imagine that um, 
the reason we don't see studies like that out and published is because it changes so quickly, not just from year to year or from quarter to quarter, but from month to month. So as uh, uh, more interest is there, you may see some published studies, but it will just be ballpark figures. If you want specifics, go to the Alternative Fuel Data Center website and it should give you the answer. And, and like I mentioned, we don't prefer one fuel over the other. Uh, we just present the information and let the consumers kind of figure it out for themselves because what works in one area for one particular industry, and right here we, we've got private industry, we've got a utility, uh, we've got a local government, and myself a university. What works for me in California may not work for a university in another part of the country, may not even work for a university or a commercial fleet right in my neck of the woods. Great. Um, other questions? Okay, go ahead. Thanks for first. Okay. Hi, I'm Ann Marie. I'm a AAA as well as Senator Haykamp. I have two questions. Uh, the first one related to hybrids and natural gas vehicles, and the second is fuel cell vehicles. Um, so I was wondering if there is any benefit of using a hybrid and natural gas vehicle, particularly for that start applications in city driving. Um, in thinking, you know, adding a battery could allow you to use your generator's braking since the vehicle is actually heavier, but maybe the battery adds too much weight, so this isn't, isn't actually as much as a measure. Um, and the second, um, so we talked a lot about natural gas and the reasons seem really clear. Uh, I was wondering if there's any future you see for using fuel cell vehicles and particularly in a fleet application. I, well, I was going to say, I can take some of that. Uh, I mean, having worked at Coca-Cola, I can talk a little bit about fuel cell technology. Uh, all of our corpus for fuel cell technology is about uh, we went to electric. And uh, it's a good application. I haven't seen anything on road yet that's uh, worthwhile looking at, uh, at least to the test stages at this point. As far as uh, CNG and hybrid application, I agree with you. I think that's a perfect application if we can control the weight issues. Um, we're currently uh, in uh, San Diego, we're testing a hydraulic hybrid um, with natural gas. So we're going to couple those two technologies together um, to get some of those dual benefits. Um, we are looking down the road about uh, testing some electric hybrid with natural gas as well because I think that's a deeply uh, good benefit. But uh, right now, it's uh, just a matter of how much weight we can get off that truck before it really becomes viable for us in the industry. Okay, let me add a, a real quick comment to the hybrid question. So, um, obviously, you know about the mainstream OEM hybrids that are manufactured, but there's also some uh, what I like to call uh, tier one and tier two suppliers that offer aftermarket product. And I know Steve has experimented with them, and, and we're using some ourselves that. The manufacturer provides the right size of the battery pack and typically does exactly what you talked about where um, you know the, the battery is used essentially for launch and propulsion assist. It gives you about a 20%, in some cases 30% fuel economy savings. It also uh, recaptures uh, energy in the form of regenerative braking. So that, that form is a little, I mean that term is a little confusing to some people because they say, well, they think the brakes are actually doing something and they're not really. All you're doing is reversing the polarity of the electric motor and the motor itself creates friction as it's generating electricity to put back into the battery. But we have found them to be very effective and the one hands down uh, thing that's been proven that nobody will argue about is it does help with uh, brake wear and, and that's pretty significant to companies like ours when when you've got big trucks, and a, a brake job on a big truck is typically like an every 18 month to two year event, and you're talking in, in some cases from $5,000 to $10,000 to do a brake job, so that is not insignificant whatsoever. But I do think um, what you mentioned is a, a surprising thing to me from an OEM perspective is that you don't see more start-stop technology because it's a very low cost way to get a pretty significant amount of fuel savings. So the uh, message to the OEMs would be, <laughs> you know, let's incorporate the technology into, into more vehicles. 
And, and there are some things you can do too to offset the weight. Now, obviously, if you put electric uh, powertrains on, you can decrease your your fuel capacity to offset some of that weight. Uh, interesting to hear on uh, regenerative braking for us is a big win in the refuge industry because we do a lot of start and stops. You have residential routes with over a thousand stops on them. You think about the wear on your brake. We don't. We have some trucks that don't even go eight months before we have to rewind those brakes. So uh, that would be a big win for us. Well, I have some good news for you also. Uh, the D Department of Energy Vehicle Technologies Program is very interested in new and emerging technology. This is an area that they're, they're looking at. Hybrids is clearly one of the main uh, ways to improve fuel economy. And also being from the state of California, the California Energy Commission is also interested in this specific application. And there's some current funding opportunities right now to do some demonstration projects for heavy duty natural gas hybrids. There are a couple of companies that have already stepped forward. Um, there might even be three of them. And uh, getting to your fuel cell question, again, being in California, uh, there's a pretty aggressive plan to create the hydrogen highway. There should be 61 stations out here in the near future. Uh, I think the number now is closer to 20. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Um, and 2015 is the year for commercial release of fuel cell vehicles. These are going to be light duty applications. Um, I'm not really sure on, I'm, I'm sure they can be used. Fuel cells can be used in fleet applications. I'm just not sure about this first release of vehicles since they tend to be light duty and targeted to the consumer. I suspect that fleets aren't the primary target uh, for that initial release. But the good news is commercial fuel cells are going on sale in California by 2015 which is right around the corner. And who knows what all that's going to drop once things really do come into the market. And I think that it's also, I, it was really, really interesting to hear your whole discussion um, among all of you with regard to looking at the hybridization of technology. Because so often, I mean, that's really how we do end up providing much more efficiency and issues that it's the more fuel that we can save. Um, it is the best of all. And and so often if we just look at how we can plan technology put them all together so that we really optimize the overall benefits um, and reduce noise um, too as, as another added benefit too the more we are electrifying uh, some of these uh, some of these applications. Uh, I think there was a question down here. Go ahead. Good morning. You all sort of touched on um, different federal incentives especially the 50 cent rebate. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on incentives at the state or even local level, especially state legislatures and state public utility commissions, and um, what those incentives could look like if them for alternative fuel. Uh, just to repeat the question, um, I'm going to summarize. Uh, what, what is the importance or significance of state incentives similar to the 50 cent alternative fuel tax credit and what would these state incentives look like? Well, I'm just going to say they're obviously important to us. I mean, you look at a um, natural gas vehicle, for example, they're about $30,000 in no cost. And uh, the trash truck nowadays, a common truck, is about $300,000 investment. So adding another $30,000 and 10% uptick on that. So obviously any incentives we can get uh, in private business to offset those costs is, is welcome. We have taken advantage of those, both in my role here at Republic and then previously at uh, Coca-Cola, where we, in, I think over a two or three year period at Coca-Cola, I think we leveraged about $20 million you know, in, in savings to help us uh, deploy that fleet. So um, I think that's a big advantage, and the, the more the, the municipality and the federal government can do that, that really helps us spur the I can echo on that too. I think with the uh, small municipality government fleet, you know, we're looking for that 50 cent rebate, you know, per gallon we purchase. And also the state, you know, we just got a thousand uh, dollar per vehicle rebate. So um, I've got roughly six, seven thousand dollars back. So what I can do is turn around and take that money, reinvest it right back, and convert two more vehicles. So with our budgets the way they are, you know, all the tax credits we can get, uh, our goal is we just bring it right back into another bit to get another clean energy. Uh, I, I think there it needs to be a combination of federal and state or local incentives. It's, it's sort of this big network 
of opportunity that help folks make the decision. <clears throat> I, re I really like the fuel tax credit, but also um, rebates are very effective. Uh, California has a very effective voucher program as well, which is kind of interesting. That the, the, there's two schools of thought. Do you incent the vehicle at the time of purchase, and then do you offer a rebate after it's purchased? Well, California has figured out which one is best because they're both extremely successful. So those, uh, the fuel tax incentive by Yon is really good. Uh, credits, I mean, excuse me, rebates or, or voucher incentives are also very effective methods. And it, I think it needs to go a little bit farther than just the state level. It gets down to the local level in California where we have a network of air quality management districts, air pollution control districts. Uh, we also have funding opportunities through our metropolitan planning organization in the Bay Area happens to be the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Commission. So you have this network of funding providers that working together can make, make projects like this much easier for folks to implement. But I think state and local is essential. But, uh, we, we don't want to rely on just the federal government to drive these programs forward. Um, but it also sounds like, as you said, that it really does need to be a combination to provide the greatest effectiveness for uh, both fleets and to really move alternative fuels into, into the mix. Um, okay, we have time for one more question, if there is one. Okay, uh, I want to thank our panel very, very much and great job in terms of providing a lot of information uh, and it's really, really key points that as you talk to policymakers, um, to the public, and, and that all of these are very, very important issues that help us all much better understand technology, the fuels, the multiple benefits, why they're important, and how they really, really make sense. So thank you very, very much.